What's up everybody, this is Rupit and uh, welcome back. Today we are going to be summarizing module, wait, yeah, module seven, sorry. <laughs> Course one, module seven. Uh, let's not waste any time. I hope you like this video. Um, I do have an exam coming up soon. So I'm just uh, going through the last module before I take my exam. So let's get back into uh, studying. Course one, module seven, lesson one. Lesson one talks about legislation impacting the marketing activities of a salesperson. So let's summarize this lesson one. The impact of the national do not call list on a brokerage's uh, activities. The national do not call list provides consumers with a choice to reduce the number of unsolicited, unsolicited, unsolicited uh, telemarketing calls they receive by registering uh, their landline, cell phone, uh, and uh, fax machine numbers on the national do not call list. By federal law, a telemarketer cannot contact a consumer uh, whose name and telephone number are in the national do not call list. Any violation could lead to penalties. Uh, brokerages involved with cold, call, cold calling or telemarketing are required under federal law to be registered with and have access to the national do not call list. Uh, they must ensure compliance with the national do not call list uh, rules uh, to avoid penalties. Um, a brokerage as a telemarketer uh, must also maintain an internal uh, brokerage list. Uh, so the internal do not call list, uh, consumers were contacted and stated that they do, they do not want to receive calls or faxes uh, from the brokerages, uh, from the brokerage must be placed on this list. The impact uh, of uh, the national do not call list. If a salesperson uh, makes telemarketing calls to consumers registered on the do not call list, uh, the national do not call list, it could lead to complaints from consumers, uh, sanctions or fines. Uh, before making uh, calls uh, on behalf of the brokerage, a salesperson must uh, check the brokerage's policies and procedures on telemarketing and the national do not call list. So uh, the federal government introduced CASL to protect protect Canadians from unsolicited uh, CEMs that could potentially lead to spam, uh, malware, malware, and uh, other internet-related threats. The intent of a CASL is to provide a relatively secure online environment for consumers. Um, before sending a CEM, a uh, salesperson must obtain uh, consent from the recipient identify themselves and provide the means uh, for the recipient to withdraw consent. Issues related to uh, obtaining CEM consent. A salesperson can send a CEM only if they have written or implicit consent from the recipient. In addition, the information uh, in the CEM should confirm, uh, conform the minimum requirements uh, for advertising specific uh, spe specified in uh, specified in section 36 of the code of ethics uh, written or expressed consent in the context uh, of electronic communication means that a recipient has opted in through an online or physical sign up form uh, implied consent is less direct and is based on the brokerage or the salesperson having a prior relationship with the recipient even though the conditions uh, for express consent has not been met, it is reasonable to assume that the brokerage or the salesperson have uh, permission to send a CEM. Uh, the Competition Act. The Competition Act is a federal statute addressing uh, many forms of competition in the interest of promoting a fair and efficient Canadian uh, market marketplace. This legislation seeks to protect, protect consumers by regulating selected business conduct throughout Canada. The Competition Act implies, uh, sorry, the Competition Act applies uh, with few exceptions to all business enterpri enterprises, including real estate brokerages. Uh, contravention of the Competition Act can lead to significant uh, penalties, lost time, and negative uh, publicity uh, for the brokerage and the salesperson. That was lesson one, so do not call anybody on the national do not call list. Uh, brokerages must have uh, internal do not call list, uh, must have consent for CEMs, 
you can send CEMs if you have prior relationship with the uh, buyer or seller. Uh, and yeah, that was lesson one. Let's move on to lesson two. Lesson two uh, talks about understanding the potential impact of tax leg legislation on the purchase, sale, or lease property. So the difference between business income and capital gains. Business, <clears throat> excuse me. Business income refers to income a person earned from an activity undertaken for profit, such as the sale of a property. A business income does not include a sales per, uh, does not include salaries of a person received uh, from an employer. Capital gain refers to the increase in value of the capital property from the date of the property from the date the property was purchased or the valuation date um, of December 22, uh, 1971, or whatever it is later. Um, capital gain gains are taxed differently than in business income. Uh, with business income, the entire amount is taxed. With capital income, oh, sorry, with capital gain, only 50% uh, of it is taxed. Treatment of a principal residence under the Income uh, Tax Act. A principal residence is a house, an apartment, or a duplex, uh, or a condominium, a cottage, a houseboat, a trailer, a mobile home, or a share in a corporation, corporative housing corporation, um, where a person usually lives. The Income Tax Act specifies different tax treatment depending on whether a property is used as a principal residence or for generating business slash investment uh, income. While the principal residence is generally excluded from taxation under the act, tax, taxes are payable uh, on the business and investment uh, income. To ensure there are no outstanding tax obligation where the seller is a non-resident of Canada, the seller has not paid tax required on the capital gain, section 116 of the Income Act, uh, imposes the tax obligation on the buyer. If the, seller, if the seller's lawyer does not receive a certificate from the Ministry of National Revenue stating that the tax has been paid, the buyer's lawyer will hold back a percentage of the sale price in order to have the money uh, to pay the seller's tax liability. Pretty simple. Lesson three. Impact of environmental legislation on property ownership, use, and development. Okay. The EPA is the primary environmental legislation impacting the ownership and use of real property in Ontario. The objective of this legislation is to promote sustainable uh, development that benefits the uh, present generation without compromising uh, the future generation's ability to meet their own needs. So the roles of the Ministry of the Environment. Um, uh, so the Ministry of Environment is empowered to investigate matters concerning pollution, uh, waste management, water disposal, and litter management uh, with an objective to protect and conserve uh, natural uh, environment. The ministry uh, exercises a range of powers, including search and seizure, uh, seizure provisions uh, to ensure adherence to envir environmental regulations. The EPA empowers officers to enter and search premises, interview indiv individuals, and examine document, uh, documents to ensure violation of the EPA are dealt with uh, expedientially. 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 Oh, new word. <clears throat> the impact of the EPA on a salesperson activity. A, salesperson, a salesperson needs to have a general understanding of how the EPA applies to Ontario. Having, having an awareness of uh, potential hazards and general knowledge of key environment provisions uh, will, benefit, uh, will be beneficial in their day-to-day -day interactions with the seller or buyer. The purpose of an env environmental site assessment. So the purpose uh, of an in environmental site assessment is to determine if there is any environmental contamination such as petroleum uh, and any contamination within the building uh, such as uh, ab asbest asbestos. Uh, the environmental site assessment is performed by a third party professional. Environmental site assessments are broadly grouped under three levels of ana analysis referred to as phase phases. 
Phase one and phase two analysis and anal analysis could apply in the case of due diligence. Phase three involves a remedial work. That's lesson three. Moving on to lesson four. Additional legislation impacting the use and potential development of a property. Uh, let's go to the summary here. So the, provi the provincial policy statement uh, 2014 provides the foundation for land use uh, planning policies to address issues facing s uh, specific geographic uh, geographic areas in Ontario. The Green Belt, and the Oak Ridge Marine Marine Conservation Park Plan, and the Niag Niagara Escarpment Plan work together to determine where urbanization should take place. This collaboration uh, ensures that agriculture, ecological, and hydro hydrological features, areas, and functions are protected. The Green Belt includes a large and important strip of land, and development in these areas may be uh, curtailed or disallowed. The Impact of Endanger Endangered Species Act in Ontario, more than 200 species are threatened uh, due to the loss of habitat, uh, pollution, roads, invasive species, and other threats. Uh, administered by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, the Endangered Species Act aims to protect these threatened plants, animals, and their habitats that, that are at risk of disappearing. And the Endangered Species Act will impact real estate construction activities uh, on sites that are home to an endangered uh, species. So these are very, uh, it's, it's good to know these. Uh, this will probably on the, probably will be on the exam. Um, somebody told me, but yeah, somebody said just make sure you know this. Uh, okay, legislation, lesson five, legislation promoting energy conser uh, convert conservation <clears throat> so the roles of the government of Canada relating to energy efficiency with advancements in technology there are increasing opportunities to be energy efficient the role of uh, natural resources Canada is to help Canadians take advantage of advancements uh, specifically in terms of lowering energy costs reducing emissions and increasing the value of assets through, through various in initiatives um, uh, the, uh, uh, they play a vital role in housing, industry, and transportation. It uh, administers both energy efficiency and, uh, regulations and ensures that the energy using products imported, manufactured, sold, or leased in Canada comply with both federal and provincial regulations. Factors that contribute to an energy efficient home. A new home can be made energy efficient by using energy efficient design, construction, and appliances. How homeowners can make small changes to improve the energy efficiency of older homes. Uh, green buildings refer to house construction techniques that promote energy efficient, uh, effective use of resources, durability in component products, and sound environmental planning. Comprehensive home ratings uh, systems that certify green buildings are now available. These home rating systems provide an independent and reliable assessment of homes based on defined uh, parameters. Um, then they talk about the Ener EnerGuide program. The EnerGuide is the official mark of the Government of Canada used to rate and label consumer items uh, such as houses, light duty vehicles, and some energy using products. Based on their energy efficient, EnerGuide works with Canada's energy efficient regulation, energy efficiency regulations, and the Energy Star Canada program to improve Canada. Uh, sorry, to improve energy efficiency. That was lesson five. Pretty easy. Um, lesson six. We are legislation impacting new home purchases. So what? So the scope of Ontario New Home Warranty Plan Act. The Ontario New Home Warranties Plan Act governs most new home construction. Uh, this legislation outlines warranty coverage for new homes and condominiums in Ontario. The warranty requires every ven vendor to warrant uh, that a home is constructed in an efficient and competent manner, free from defects, materi uh, in material fit for habitation, uh, habitation, 
uh, constructed in accordance with the Ontario Building Code, uh, free of major constructural uh, defects and subject to any warranties as prescribed um, by the regulations. In addition, there is protection to the, for the buyer's deposit, uh, delayed closing and situations of finishing during uh, construction. So the warranty coverage under the Ontario New Home Warranties Plan. Under the Ontario New Home Warranty Plan, the builder and the seller of new homes in Ontario must provide warranty coverage to buyers. According to the plan, a home is eligible for three warranties with specific coverage for one, two, and seven period, seven year periods. Um, let me go into detail with this because this might be important. So warranty coverage under the Ontario, uh, okay, uh, each warranty period for a new home or condominium unit begins on the date of possession, except for warranty on a condominium's common elements, uh, which begins upon the registration of the condominium declaration, oh, declaration and description. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so the one year warranty, the builder warrants for one year uh, of the from the date of possession that the home is free from defects in construction and materials and is fit to live in amidst the Ontario Building Code requirements and has no major structural defects as outlined under the seven year warranty. So the two year warranty protection is, so the two, the two year warranty addresses items such as water seepage through the basement or foundation walls, uh, defects in materials or work, uh, defects in, uh, uh, materials work in electrical uh, plumbing and heating uh, systems defects in uh, um, work that results in detachment and displacement or deterioration of exterior uh, cladding leading to detachment or serious deteriora deterioration uh, ontario building code of vi violations in relation to health and safety and major structural defects as outlined under the seven seven-year warranty so basically the two-year warranty covers uh, water seepage plumbing electrical foundations detachment deterioration uh, so that's but under the seven-year warranty any materials or work that results in failure of load-bearing part of home structures home structure any defect in materials or work that significantly uh, adversely affects the buyer's use of the building as a home so that's seven years. Uh, so that was lesson six. Let's move on to lesson uh, seven. Moving on to lesson seven. Key considerations under the Ontario Fire Code and Building Code. Uh, they talk about the purpose of Ontario Building Code. The Ontario Building Code sets out minimum standards for building design and provisions uh, regarding building safety, fire protection, and structural integrity. So requirements for a building permit, a person cannot construct or demolish a building as defined in the Ontario Building Code unless a building permit, sometimes referred to as a construction permit, is issued. Homeowners who are unaware of this requirement uh, inadvertent. Oh, inadvertently violate the Ontario Building Code by not obtaining a building permit for a home renovation project. These requirements for building permits uh, may differ from across uh, municipalities. The relevance of the Ontario Fire Code. The Ontario Fire Code provides um, for the safety of occupants, occupants in existing buildings through the elimination or control of fire hazards in and around buildings. Uh, the maintenance of uh, life safety systems in buildings and establishment of a fire safety plan in those buildings were necessary. Um, were necessary, sorry. When new Ontario fire code regulations are passed, a property may require some upgrades or retrofits to comply with it. Requiring to install smoke, carbon, and monoxide alarms. The Ontario Fire Code requires every home to have working smoke alarms on every story and smoke alarms to be installed outside of all sleeping areas. These requirements apply to all single-family, semi-detached townhomes, 
whether owner occupied or rented. The Ontario Fire Code, which only applies to existing structures, requires that a carbon monoxide alarm be installed a adjacent to each sleeping, sleeping area of a single family dwelling that contains a fuel burning appliance, fireplace, or an attached garage. For multi-family uh, multi dwellings, such as a condominium or apartment building, a carbon monoxide alarm is required adjacent to each sleeping area where the unit contains a fuel burning appliance or a fireplace within the suite. Or the unit has a common wall or a common floor assembly with a storage garage or a service room containing a fuel burning appliance. Very important, smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms. Um, yeah, very important. Lesson seven is complete. Let's move on to lesson eight. Lesson eight talks about considerations under the, elec under the Ontario Electrical Safety Code. So the role of the Electrical Safety Authority. The Ontario Electrical Safety uh, Code specific, specific sorry. The Ontario Electrical Safety uh, Code specifies a safety standards for installing and maintaining electrical equipment. The purpose of the Ele Ontario Electrical Safety Code is to ensure a house or building complies with all required safety standards. The Ontario Electrical Safety Code is updated by the Electrical Safety Authority on, on an ongoing basis in response to changes in technology and new safety practices. Requirements to obtain a, a permit from the Electrical Safety Authority. Electrical work uh, related to installations, repairs, replacements, or alterations uh, that a homeowner undertakes through an, uh, through an electrical contractor must comply with the Ontario Electrical Safety Code, and all necessary permits must be, um, must be obtained. Most electrical work requires that the contra uh, contractor apply for and obtain a permit from the ESA. Electrical work performed in a house without an electrical safety authority permit could pose a safety risk to occupants. In addition, an insurance company may not be liable to pay for damages that may occur due, the, due to the electrical work performed without a permit. So a salesperson obligation, a salesperson representing a seller or a buyer need to promote uh, promote a pr and protect their best interests as set out in section 4 of the code of ethics uh, if working with a seller they should ask if they are aware of any defects with their property and if they have made any improvements to the property during their time of ownership so that was lesson 8 lesson 8 means basically you need an electrical permit uh, if you're making any sort of uh, uh, upgrades in your house uh, concerning electrical uh, systems, you must ha uh, deal with a certified contractor and they must have a, a valid permit from the Electrical Safety Board. Uh, lesson 9, Compliance with Fuel Storage Tank Regulations. Okay, so the TSSA regulatory requirements for fuel storage tanks. The TSSA is responsible for all above ground fuel storage tanks and above an above ground tank refers to any tank that is installed at or above ground level within a building or within a secondary containment. An underground oil tank or fuel storage tank is buried um, or partially buried con is a partially bur buried container in direct contact with earth or backfill that contains fuel oil to be used in appliances such as furnaces, uh, furnaces or boilers. These tanks have fallen under close scrutiny, scrutiny, scrutiny over the past few years because of the possibility of leakage into the soil and resulting contaminations. Uh, to safeguard the environment such as threats, the TSSA, um, which reports to the Ministry of Consumer Services, oversees gasoline handling and underground fuel storage tanks. All underground fuel storage tanks must now be registered with the TSSA and inspected or fuel will not be delivered to the tanks. The regulatory control under the Technical Standards and Safety Act uh, apply to a range of activities 
uh, including installation, testing, maintenance, repair, removal, replacement, inspection, and use of appliances, uh, equipment, components, and accessories where fuel oil is to be used as fuel. The environmental risk associated with fuel tanks. Um, if an oil spill occurs from an underground storage uh, tank, um, the property owner must contact a TSSA registered fuel oil contractor to help find and stop the leak and clean up any leaked fuel oil. The owner is also required to call the Spills Action Center of the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. The fuel may leak into the ground and in other neighboring areas and also affect uh, the local drinking water. So very important. And let's move on to lesson 10. Lesson 10 is basically summary practice activities, which I do rec uh, recommend you do on your own. And module summary, let's just see if we've missed anything or any new information that may be helpful to us. Um, we've we've talked about most, most of uh, all these things we've already talked about. Uh, yeah, so that was uh, module seven. Module seven wasn't as big as um, module six, but it is very important. There's a lot of information that needs to be uh, um, remembered and known. Um, so yeah, I've been summarizing each module. This was the last module in course one. I do have an exam coming up soon. Uh, hopefully I do well in it. And uh, hopefully my videos have helped you uh, study course one. Uh, if it did, let me know. If not, let me know how I, how I can improve. And uh, yeah, make sure to like and comment so I know. Uh, thank you and uh, good luck on your course. Thanks. Bye.